Chapter 1. The Aftermath of the Xenu Invasion 1.1. Desperate Moments Hilda Muller, Marcus White and House Rashid security guards exited the lift at the top level of Rashid Tower in Rashidium. Walking towards the courtroom, where the sentencing of Kayla Eisenstein posing as Alicia White was happening. Hilda Muller saw Ibrahim Rashid through the doorway at the end of the corridor. Ibrahim Rashid, the leader of House Rashid faction, was penalising the imposter Kayla Eisenstein for vandalising the Chops Pyramid. Hilda Muller gave the signal to follow her and the security guards followed her towards the courtroom together with Marcus White. Seeing the troops out to get her, Alicia White jumped up to Ibrahim Rashid and pushed his hand towards a control panel, closing the courtroom door. Hilda realised that there was no time to lose. She rushed towards the door to get in, but she was too late. Hilda could feel her skin burnt, from colliding with the electromagnetic force field that protected the bulletproof glass door that had sealed off the room. She had got there too late, and the madwoman, Alicia, was holding the Terran Council leaders hostages. What Hilda saw next shocked her and her crew. The Terran Council leaders dropped unconscious to the ground, probably due to poison gas. And in front of their eyes, Alicia transformed to their greatest enemy, the infamous terrorist Kayla Eisenstein. Get those doors open now! Hilda screamed out. Hilda looked at Kayla. She could tell that Kayla was trying to activate the Terran Council blood encryption machine. This machine was rarely used, and Hilda could not figure out what on earth the damn terrorist intended to do with the device. Hilda kept studying Kayla. The insurgent Kayla had managed to access the blood encryption machine, but Hilda would not be able to know what she had put into the machine until she had access to it, as it was heavily encrypted. Hilda watched as Kayla was bashing the skulls of the unconscious Terran Council leaders with a metal sculpture. With the amount of brain matter on the floor, it was highly unlikely that they would be able to resurrect any of the fallen leaders. We'll break through the doors in 20 minutes, one of the Rashid soldiers said. Good, make sure to wear protective equipment we don't know what gas she has released in there, Hilda replied. It would be a public relations nightmare to explain how the most wanted terrorist in the solar system had managed to access a Terran Council meeting and murder all the faction leaders. If things came to the worst, there was even a risk for potential uprisings among the civilian population now that the power of the Terran Council, for the second time, in just a couple of months, came to be questioned. But in the situation, there was also an opportunity for Hilda, personally. Hilda had suspected that Joachim Muller had something to do with the assassination of her father, that occurred three months earlier. Hilda had lacked proof, however, and she knew better than accusing the leader of her faction without any evidence to support her. With Joachim Muller and Benjamin Muller dead on the floor on the other side of that fortified door, things were looking better for her position in House Muller. With the two of them dead, Hilda was second in line to leadership Hilda was interrupted from her succession planning when an intense blue light appeared in the horizon, blinding her temporarily. When she regained her eyesight, she saw something that shocked her. A blue portal had opened on top of the Great Pyramid, and out of it came a massive horde of alien species.
Hilda suddenly got a severe migraine, and the world became blurry and stopped making any sense to her. This was because the Xenu invaders had brought stolen Zetan technology, and this technology disrupted the bionic microchips she had in her brain. Hilda could hear unintelligible chatter on the soldiers' transistors. She realized that her bionic microchips were broken, as she could no longer understand Arabic, the language of House Rashid, where she currently located. Fortunately, she had managed to learn some English biologically using her brain, and she spoke to the petrified Marcus White. Hilda Muller, speaking with a firm German accent, Stay close to me, Marcus. We are under attack by foreign life forms. Marcus White said, What are those things? We're all going to die. Hilda Muller said, Nay, we are not. The army will get here shortly and sort out this mess. Just fight to stay alive until then. Marcus White said, Fight with what? We don't carry any weapons. Hilda Muller said, The Rashid soldiers will have to give us weapons. Hilda Muller tried to talk to the Rashid soldiers to get weapons for her and Marcus. This didn't work as the Rashid soldiers only spoke Arabic and they were too agitated to make any sense. Suddenly, Hilda heard a thundering shriek and turned around. The scream had scattered the fortified glass to the boardroom as well as the fortified glass door that kept Hilda out. Hilda studied the source of the shriek. A two-meter-tall humanoid-like monstrosity with a shiny purple eyes, accompanied by several three-meter-tall beasts. <coughs> the humanoid-like monstrosity, Rangda, somehow knocked Kayla unconscious and grabbed her over her shoulder and jumped out of the building of Rashi Tower. The other beasts, however, attacked. Hilda pulled Marcus down to the ground and thus saved his life when a Xenu beast jumped towards her. The Rashid soldier behind them was not as lucky and got decapitated by the fearsome creatures. The panicking Rashid soldiers shot at random towards the Xenus, but to limited effect, as the Xenus had Zetan ballistic energy absorber and very thick skin that was hard to penetrate from the low caliber submachine guns and pistols that the Rashid security guards were carrying. Use your plasma knives, Hilda shouted to the Rashid soldiers, but they didn't understand her and they panicked and were mowed down and decapitated one by one by the razor-sharp claws of the Xenus. <coughs> Hilda picked up the plasma knife from one of the fallen soldiers. She took a leap and just managed to save Marcus White from being killed and eaten by piercing the skull of the Xenu with a plasma knife slaying the beast that was attacking him. Hilda dragged Marcus to the boardroom where the dead Terran council leaders were lying on the floor. Since they were at high altitude, the room was very windy. Hilda and Marcus ran to the window. There was no way out. They heard a roar. It was the Xenus behind them that had finished killing off the Rashid soldiers and the beasts had turned their attention towards Hilda and Marcus. Marcus White, in desperation, said, What do you say, Hilda? Should we end our lives with a jump off the building towards the romantic sunset, or would you rather be Xenu food? Hilda Muller said, You do whatever that pleases you. I am a soldier. I'll stay and fight. Get down! 
Hilda pulled Marcus to the ground, and behind them came their salvation in the form of a heavily armed Hausmuller's combat helicopter. Hilda grabbed the blood encryption tablet and got on the aircraft. Hilda Muller said, "The city is overrun with aliens. Let's get out of here." Helicopter pilot said, "Hilda, what about Joachim and Benjamin?" Hilda Muller responded to the pilot and said, "They are dead beyond resurrection." Murdered in cold blood by the vile Kayla Eisenstein. Now let's get the fuck out of here before those monsters come back. Helicopter pilot said, "Javol, Frawl, and Mula." As the helicopter left Rashidium City, Hilda was studying the carnage that the Zenu invasion had caused in the city. Reinforcements would arrive eventually, but it would be too late to save Rashidium's inhabitants from the destruction and death caused by the sudden and unexpected alien invasion. One point two. Hilda Muller seducing herself an ally. Hilda Muller was back in the relative safety of her luxurious apartment in the European Tower located in Hanstadt. She was looking at the exhausted Marcus White, who was currently sleeping on her couch in the lounge area. While she could easily have housed him in one of the many guest apartments in European Tower. Keeping him near was a crucial strategic decision. While sleeping seemed to be a good idea to relieve the stress, Hilda would not have it. The slaughter caused by the Zenu invasion at the Terran Council meeting in Rashidium City had left all the Terran Council factions, including her own, leaderless. There was a lot of opportunity for someone with ambition to advance their own position. Hilda thought. Hilda was aware that in the upheaval that would follow, there would be a lot of knifing to come, and she would much rather be the one holding the knife than being the receiver. Since the assassination of her father, Supreme Commander Matthias Muller, just a few months earlier. Hilda had seen her own power diminish, as this had put her out of reach to the leadership of the House Muller. Officially, Matthias Muller had been assassinated by Martian rebels, but Hilda had never bought into that ploy. After all, why would the Martians send assassins after her father, who was the only one that could be convinced to abort the attack? Instead, Hilda was convinced that it was her cousin. Benjamin Muller, who was behind the assassination, but she had laid low with her ideas, as it would have been hazardous for her to accuse Benjamin, the second son of the House Muller leader Joachim Muller, without any hard evidence. But now both Joachim and Benjamin were dead, and the way lay open for her to contend for leadership. Officially, Joachim's youngest son, Michael Muller, would be the first in line. But Hilda doubted that he would have any interest in leadership, as he preferred living an easy, careless life in luxury. But she would need allies to secure her claim, both on the inside and on the outside. Hilda glimpsed at the sexy, half-naked body of the sleeping Marcus White. It was time to combine business and pleasure. Hilda went back to her bedroom and got changed into a sexy dress. Hilda admired her own body in the mirror, which felt a bit strange as she saw herself as her strict father's daughter, a strong military woman, and not as a seductress. Then again, to play the game of politics, she needed to be able to do both. She sprayed herself with a super potent pheromone perfume and approached Marcus White. 
Hilda Muller, speaking softly, said, Marcus, darling, wake up. Marcus White woke up with a twitch, and he looked at Hilda with confusion and disorientation before he managed to speak. He said, Hilda, what's happening? Where am I? Hilda touched Marcus's face gently and spoke again. She said, So, so, you are safe here with me in Europium Tower. Hilda smiled seductively and waited for the pheromones to influence Marcus's body. They worked slower than she had anticipated due to shock and stressful circumstances, but a while later they both participated in an extended orgasmic sexual trance. Once they were done, Hilda fell asleep in Marcus's arms, relieved of sexual tension and happy to have a potential ally for the months to come. One point three A heartbroken Metatron receives news from Earth and finds a surrogate mother for Sabina. Metatron was watching the news of the death of Terran Council leaders and the massive incursion of Sinu alien species from Eden. Tears were running down his cheeks. Oh, Kayla, what have you done? he said to himself. He had supported Kayla's idea to take the appearance of Alicia White, but she had never filled him in on the plan to open the portals to another dimension and let large man-eating aliens attack Earth. He watched images of dismembered corpses, pictures of eaten or half-eaten humans, and the images would always haunt his eyes. It wasn't the carnage itself that scared him the most. After all, the Terran Council's synthetic virus attack on Palmshell City on Mars a few years back had generated similar images. But it was that humanity was no longer on top of the food chain. What worried Metatron the most was the future of humanity. When a massacre was caused by other humans, Metatron knew that our species would always survive. But with the latest carnage caused by this alien invasion, who knew what the future would hold? Metatron tried contacting Kayla via the telepathic divine technology, but there was only static. This didn't mean anything, as Earth and Eden were too far apart to establish a sonic connection with the technology. But to Metatron, it confirmed his fears that Kayla had died among the other thousands of fatalities in Rashidium City. Metatron looked at the calendar and visited the medical bay, where the frozen two-month embryo of his and Kayla's future child was cryogenically frozen. What would he do now that Kayla was gone? He had tried discussing what Kayla wanted in case she died on several occasions, but she had never seemed interested in discussing the topic. Metatron had known what he wanted all along, to raise a family with Kayla, but her fiery nature stopped her from settling down while there were still grave injustices in the world. Paradoxically, it was Kayla's nature that he loved the most about her while it was also what stopped them from having the future he dreamed of. Metatron studied the vitals of the embryo. It was cryogenically frozen, and it had not changed since his last examination. According to the DNA scanner, the fetus had an excellent A-grade genetics, according to Terran and Martian standards, which was the same quality as Metatron had. He studied the simulation based on the fetus's DNA, showcasing how Sabina would look at different ages. She would look a lot like her mother, Kayla, and this made Metatron miss her even more. Metatron elevated himself from his state of self-pity. Kayla was gone, but through her daughter, Sabina, 
she could live on. She just had to live on. Why else had he already given this small lump of genetic material a name? But Metatron didn't want to cultivate the fetus in a synthetic womb, as he didn't want to create a copy of himself. So he needed a surrogate mother. Soon after, there was a knock on the door, and one of the Metatron's Edenite employees, Melissa, entered the room. Melissa gave Metatron a worried look and then spoke to him. Melissa said, "Master Metatron, you haven't eaten for two days. I'm concerned about you." Metatron tried to force a smile, but it failed, and his watery, teary eyes exposed him. He said, "I'm okay, just not feeling hungry." Melissa said. Come on now, Metatron. You have already admitted that you are human and not an angel. All humans need support from time to time. Let me be your pillar of support for once, as you've been to me so many times before. Metatron studied Melissa. She had a rather plain Edenite appearance, but her heart was pure as gold. As Melissa had not opted to have her divine technology human chip removed, he could see her every thought, which was a blessing and a curse. Could he ask her to do what he wanted? He could undoubtedly command it, but Metatron did not believe in forcing people unless it was necessary for the common good. It was vital for him to find a surrogate mother to give life to Sabina. But he couldn't justify it with a common good. Eventually, he decided that he could ask her for a favor and spoke up. He said, "There is something you could do for me, something far more important than fetching me lunch." Melissa looked at him with a reassuring smile. She said, "Metatron, you don't need to be shy around me. Just tell me, and I will be happy to help." Metatron said, "Thanks, Melissa. What is bothering me is the death of Kayla." Melissa said, "Mistress Kayla is dead. That's terrible. Are you certain?" Metatron said, "As sure as I can be. But that is where you come into the picture. I want you to bear my and Kayla's daughter." Melissa said, "But she is dead." And how can one woman bear another woman's child? Metatron said, "I can explain the signs to you later. Is it something that would interest you?" Melissa said, "I would be honored to carry the child of you and Kayla, who will undoubtedly be the Messiah of our people." Metatron said, "Thank you, Melissa." Stay here in the medical bay, and I will explain the procedure more in detail before we go through with it. After having said that, Metatron gave Melissa a thorough scientific explanation of the procedure. Melissa, being an Edenite, lacked an understanding, but it mattered little. And shortly after, she was pregnant with Metatron's and Kayla's child. One point four, dissatisfaction in victory. Melchior Dorovich was studying a political map of Mars in the late Hellas Petrakis's office inside the presidential palace of the Olympus Republic. Despite winning a total victory, with the remaining Terran Council leaders literally begging him for peace, finally securing the independence of Martian nations, he wasn't happy. As a matter of fact, he was deeply unsatisfied. Melchior's problem was that the young, beautiful, and heroic Kayla Eisenstein was the one who was glorified for the Martian victory, while his contribution was hardly recognized at all. 
Thus, the temporary power that Kayla granted him before going on her successful suicide mission to Earth was now massively contested among other contenders for leadership, both on Mars and specifically in the Olympus Republic. The Olympus Republic was a de jure, and a new president needed to be elected to replace the former president Hellas Petrakis who had fallen in the Martian War of Independence was needed. But Melchior wasn't going to give up his power, either leaving to serve some Martian, or worse yet, go back to Eden to be ruled by the wimp Metatron. Melchior had tasted the intoxicating feeling that was absolute power, and he would never willingly give it up. And why would he? Melchior walked up to a mirror and studied his face. There was a large scar on the right side of his face, with his outer ear missing. He could hear the tinnitus beeping, and the low-grade constant migraine was throbbing in his brain, making his days miserable. He had been offered advanced gene therapy to heal his wounds, but he had rejected the treatment. His injuries made him who he was, and they fueled his rage and ambition. He was Melchior Dorovich, the true hero of Mars, who had soldiered on, despite immense pain, to lead the final decisive victory against the Terran Council, while the supposed heroine, Kayla Eisenstein, set out the final battle and then deceptively claimed all the glory, claiming to have stopped Bjorn Muller from crushing Phobos onto the Martian surface. Melchior made up his mind. He wouldn't strive to rule by being popular, he would rule through fear. And fortunately, his implanted god microchip gave him great opportunity to terrify his subjects and opponents. Melchior clenched his fist and watched in joy how he killed his opponents, one by one, using the psionic powers granted to him by the divine Zetan technology. Having murdered the last contender for the presidency, he gave away a sinister laugh before calling in a few courtesans to violently fulfill his other needs, to eat them alive. <coughs> One point five, an unpleasant awakening. Kayla woke up after what felt like a lifetime. She was standing up, and despite the pain in her legs, she couldn't fall to the ground. An invisible force field was encapsulating her, preventing her from moving at all, except for her eyes. She gazed round the room, and she saw a reflective surface where her reflection showed. She was shocked by what she saw. Her eyes were glowing purple, and the texture of her skin had changed completely. It was wrinkled, like the skin of a hundred years old lady, and it was thick and grey, like the skin of a reptile. Her body was in pain, and particularly her legs that were burning with lactic acid. She heard a door open, and the Xenocetan hybrid demon Rangda entered the room. Rangda said, <laughs> My apologies for the lack of formal introduction on Earth. I am Rangda, and I have been the one to give you the premonitions. You were merely detained to ensure that you were no danger to yourself or others. But worry not. Neither the aging nor the ritual will kill you here in the divine dimension, unless I intended for it to happen. Kella said, What are you talking about, you hideous and wicked creature? I helped you. If you're going to betray me, do it quickly instead of dragging things out. Rangda said, No, that is not going to happen. You see, I need you. 
the ritual that powers up my dark crystals kills Cetons outright. But since you are a human Cetan hybrid that has some Cetan DNA, I can continually drain energy from you without killing you. Killer said, So, what do you want? Ranga said, Well, for starters, I want revenge for my mother through wiping out the Zetan species that betrayed her. But ultimately, I want what the Zetans strived for but could never truly achieve. I want to reach Godhood. I want to replace the true maker as the almighty deity of the universe. <laughs> Kayla said, The true maker? That's insane! How would you possibly achieve that? Ranga said, You shall see, sweet sister, you shall see. But for now, it's time for you to sleep. After saying this, Ranga blasted Kayla with a powerful sonic blast that knocked her unconscious. After that, she used the corrupted Zeto crystals that radiated with darkness like a black hole to drain Kayla's body even more. Ranga watched how Kayla's unconscious body was twisting and shaking and Ranga laughed out loudly with a burst of twisted, diabolical laughter. <laughs> One point six. Melchior turns his gaze to Eden. Melchior Dorovich was rejoicing his overwhelming victory in the Olympus Republic elections. The fact that all the other contenders had died similar and mysterious deaths days before the election, this didn't bother him. The kill switch that was included in the lower tires of the divine technology was not common knowledge, and even if it was, who would be foolish enough to stand up against him in the Olympus Republic that had quickly been subjugated to his will? Melchior studied a political map of Mars. It was very fragmented, with hundreds of factions, and although the Olympus Republic was the single most powerful nation on Mars, it still only controlled roughly 5% of the Martian surface and population. It had been an intentional strategy by the former de facto masters from the Terran Council to keep the Martians divided to make them easy to rule. The advent of Melchior's former leader, Kayla Eisenstein, had changed this, and with the Martians united and equipped with Zetan technology, they had sent their previous Terran masters running with their tails between their legs. But with Keller missing, presumed dead, the Martians had turned on each other, and the chaos and situation on Mars were worse than ever before. The Martians needed a strong leader that united them, and Melchior was convinced that Providence meant for him to be this leader. He called in his brother, Dov Darovich, to discuss his strategy. A while later, Dove arrived at Melchior's office in the Olympus Republic, Presidential Palace. Melchior studied his brother with well-hidden contempt. Dove, despite being younger than Melchior, looked considerably older due to his beer gut, smoking habits and generally unhealthy lifestyle. While Melchior disliked his brother's lack of discipline and aspiration, he needed loyal allies, and no one was a more loyal ally than his younger brother. Melchior smiled and spoke to Dove. Welcome to Mars and the Olympus Republic, dear brother. I hope your trip from Eden was comfortable, Dove said. I can't complain. 
since Abraham Goldstein died and Kayla and Metatron started ruling Eden, I have lost faith in the Edenite society. But I would have preferred to travel in comfort on a civil carrier rather than on a military ship. Melchior said, Well, sadly, all public transport has ended due to the war. But rest easy, peace with the Terrans are coming any day now. They have more significant problems to worry about. Duff said, Yes, I don't know how Kayla did it, but releasing those aliens onto the unsuspecting people on Earth was both a stroke of genius and a terrifying act of evil. Melchior said, Yes, although she was batshit crazy with her visions and all, she still managed to pull everyone together and get things done. Now, I want to follow in her footsteps. Dove said, I have heard you are progressing well. Congratulations on your victory in the elections. Melchior said, I didn't read the elections. Dove said, but it was very convenient and all your competitors died the days before the elections. Melchior said, yes, it was. Praise Yahweh for intervening and helping me, when the Martians could not comprehend that I was the right candidate. Dove said, Seems more like a divine technology kill switch to me. How did you manage to pull it off? I thought Kayla gave you an angel chip. Melchior said, No, she gave me a god chip when she was wounded, so I could lead the attack on the Phobos base. She must have forgotten about it because she never mentioned it again when she headed to Earth to infiltrate the Terran Council. Whatever the reason is, it was a lucky coincidence, and since I do not believe in coincidence, it must have been a divine will. Dove said, I see. So why did you summon me then? I doubt that it was only for catching up on brotherly love, Mercury said. I need you. Together we can fulfill Grandmaster Abraham's visions. But a much more modern society can be built and on a much grander scale. Together we can rule Mars as its rightful god kings, Dove said. But didn't you pledge allegiance to Kayla after she overthrew and killed Abraham? Melchior said. Yes, but one should never let ideology get in the way of opportunity. Now that Kayla is gone, an opportunity is ours. I need to take the Olympus Republic army to Eden to confront Metatron and make him hand over all the Zetan technologies to us. And I will need you to stay here and rule in my stead. Duff said, I would be honoured to assist you, my dear brother, and to spread the light that is Abraham's religious dogma to the wretched unbelievers on Mars. Melchior said, Good! Head to that medical unit in the corner. It will remove your human chip and replace it with a god chip. Dove said, Are you really going to put me to the same level as yourself? There should not be two god chips ruling the same nation. Melchior said, how could I expect for you to rule in my stead if you are not equipped with the highest tire of mind-controlling Zetan technology, allowing you to instantly kill lower-tired users with your mind? Now, scram off before I change my mind. Melchior watched Dove as he entered the medical unit. It pleased him that Dove had seen things his way and agreed to help him in doing the right things. Dove would stay loyal, and if he didn't, that fat bastard would suffer so much so he would regret ever being born. Pleased with his situation, Belchior called his generals and ordered for a fleet to be prepared for destination Eden. One point seven. 
Metatron confides in Melissa and has a nightmare. Metatron was studying the terraformed asteroid Eden through the large fortified windows in the reception area of the Divine Control Center orbiting just above Eden. He had been very busy modernizing Eden and housing the influx of refugees that had come as a result of the widespread war and unrest in the solar system. While Metatron had not proclaimed Eden to be a haven, he did not have the heart to turn away the desperate people that had come his way either. And as a result, the population had swelled from 8,000 to over 20,000. The massive population increase had caused several problems which Metatron had tried solving by keeping the original Edenites and the newcomers separate. As Eden had a surface area of over 20,000 square kilometers and a perfect condition for agriculture, it was not a problem housing and feeding everyone. Yet the problem remained that sooner or later he would have to reconcile the ideologies and morals of the 29th century refugees with that of the Edenites, who until two years ago had still lived in an artificial Bronze Age society with a very outdated Bronze Age morals and belief systems, thanks to Abraham's deception and total control. Mentally exhausted, Metatron rested from his work and leaned back into a comfortable armchair. Oh, how he missed Kayla and real sleep. Having been bred and raised into Abraham's angel program, Metatron had never known real sleep for the first 120 years of his life. And instead, all the rest he had experienced was short bursts of sleep in accelerated sleep pods or extended periods of sleep being cryogenically frozen until summoned by Abraham for dutiful tasks. In neither of these sleep states had he ever experienced dreams, and it was first when Kayla had killed Abraham and set Metatron free that he had experienced real sleep and dreaming as part of the human experience. Now that Kayla was gone, Metatron had stopped sleeping, natural sleep, and returned to his learned habit of having short bursts of sleep in the accelerated sleep port. This was because of his self-sacrificing and altruistic nature, where he felt guilty for spending too much time sleeping when the Edenites needed him. But now, Metatron was at his breaking point as lack of dreams had deteriorated his soul, and he felt like he did when he was a slave to Abraham's will. He felt more like a machine than like a human. Metatron realized that he needed to sleep and dream to regain his sanity, but the problem was that he had forgotten how to relax naturally. His mind was drained, but his body was still too energized for him to fall asleep. Eventually, he realized what he needed to do. He felt guilty about it, but he just had to do it anyway for his own sanity. Metatron summoned Melissa, the surrogate mother who was pregnant with his and Kayla's unborn child, and she arrived shortly after. Melissa studied Metatron as she entered the room, he didn't look that well and looked a lot older and more burdened than usual, albeit a lot younger than his real age. Tentatively, she approached him and spoke. Oh, dear Master Metatron, you summoned me. Is everything all right with you? Metatron tried to smile, but it fell flat, and instead he responded in a somber tone. My state is no longer that important. The main thing is how things are with you. Melissa said, Don't say that. You are important to all of us. If it were not for your tireless efforts, Eden would collapse, and we would all go under. Metatron said, Maybe that's the core of my problems. 
that I have been too self-sacrificing and had given up on what I really want. Melissa said, So, what do you really want? Metatron said, I want to have human desires, human impulses for good and bad. I was bred to serve Abraham, and I did so for over a century. I helped a villainous madman doing evil deeds, knowing nothing else. Then Kayla set me free, and I started to feel human feelings. But now that she's gone, and I'm yet again a soulless servant, trying to make up for my evil deeds by serving the Edenites diligently. Melissa blushed and then stuttered insecurely. She said, I- Is this your way of telling me that you want to have sex with me? Metatron said, No, I'm after something far more critical. I need to sleep natural sleep so that I can dream again. I have never slept natural sleep on my own, you know, so I need you to sleep next to me. Melissa said, I would be honored to sleep in your bed, Master Metatron. Metatron said, Thank you, Melissa. No need to call me Master anymore. You and I are friends and equals, helping each other out in times of need. Now, let's go to my bedroom. I am exhausted. Metatron and Melissa headed to Metatron's bedroom, and in her embrace, he immediately fell asleep. The dreams he had was not the kind of vision he wanted, though, as it instead of soothing his mind, it scared and tormented him. In the dream, Metatron could see an ancient-looking woman who looked almost as old as a mummy, being tormented by a beastly alien with glowing purple eyes. Despite the tortured woman's hideous appearance, he could feel her soul and he knew that she was Kayla. Save me! Save mankind! Kayla shouted out with a weak and weary voice. In his dreams, Randa then knocked her unconscious with a sonic blast and turned to Metatron. She stared him down with her glowing purple eyes and hypnotized him in a state of paralyzed fear. Eventually, Metatron screamed his lungs out and he woke up with the bed soaked in cold sweat. Melissa looked at him with a worried face and spoke. She said, Oh dear, you look terrified. Is everything all right? Metatron said, Yes and no. Come with me to the medical bay. We need to remove your divine technology chip immediately. Melissa said, Sure, but why? Metatron said, Kayla, she spoke to me in a vision. At least I think she did. Darkness is coming and we'll all need to remove all divine technology binding microchips to stay safe. Melissa said, If you really think so, there is no time to waste. Let's go. They hurried together to the medical ward to remove Melissa's microchip, and then they devised a plan for how to remove the chips from the other Edenites as well. Hilda Muller rejoins with Marcus White and prepares to seize power. Hilda Muller was preparing her speech for the first Terran Council meeting since the catastrophe in Rashidium that had wiped out most of the organization's leadership and revealed the threat that alien life forms were coming to Earth. It had been six chaotic months. But on the bright side, it had strengthened Hilda's own position and claim for power. Before the embarrassing defeat against the Martians and the terrifying alien Xenu invasion, the Terran Council had been all about commerce and making more money, with army and security as secondary support functions for that purpose. 
with the general population realizing that the threat the extraterrestrial species posed to them, they were calling out for more protection which benefited anyone within the army. As the daughter of the deceased Supreme Commander of the Terran Council Armed Forces, Matthias Muller, Hilda had claimed the vacant position. She was not satisfied, though. Hilda did not want to be the lackey of some hedonistic plutocrat. She wanted to be the top dog herself. Hilda aimed to be the new chairman of the Terran Council, ruling over all house factions of Earth. Hilda had a good claim to the position as well. As the leader of the military forces, she had planned and reorganized the army to counter the new threat, and she had done so successfully. After the initial first few weeks of Xenu attacks, the military had managed to pinpoint the potential locations of the portals, so they could avoid being taken by surprise again. They had also adapted their weaponry to their new enemies, replacing all their ballistic guns with energy base and melee weapons. Hilda had also ordered fleets over warships in low orbit over every identified portal. The result was that the tide of the war with the invading Xenos had turned. Discouraged by their losses, the Xenos had stopped attacking Earth. Hilda spotted her hookup and strategic ally, Marcus White, in the corridor. Unfortunately, he had not managed to reach a high position in House White, but he could be useful for other purposes. She called him over and he came over to the boardroom that she was in. Hilda Muller said, Oh, Marcus, how nice it is to see you again. Marcus White said, Hi, Hilda. Thanks again for saving my life. Hilda Muller said, It was my pleasure. Especially the night that followed saving your life. She winked at him before continuing. So, do I have your support for the chairman position of the Terran Council, the first woman to ever achieve this? Marcus White said, Yes, I would vote for you for sure. But... Unfortunately, I'm not the one calling the shots, so I can't guarantee you the support from my faction. Hilda Muller said, I know, Marcus, but you can help me with something else. I want you to fuck me as hard and enjoyable as you did when we came back from Rashidium. Ha <laughs> ha! Marcus White said, are you crazy? We are on the same level as the meeting is taking place now. What if someone comes up early and sees us? Hilda said. Then let them. I will be their boss and I'm going to show them that I'm not intimidated by what they think. Quite the contrary. Having said this, Hilda released some pheromones in the room that made Marcus White irresistibly horny, and shortly afterwards, he fucked her roughly from behind. When he was done, Hilda wiped herself and smiled at the exhausted Marcus resting in an armchair. She spoke confidently to him as she left. She said, You stay. Stay here and relax, lover boy, while I take control of the council. Satisfied and confident, Hilda walked to the meeting room on the top of the floor of the European Tower. It was a great relief to have sex with a human again. She had been forced to play with droids for the last few months. Not that she was unattractive, but being powerful simply didn't have the same sex appeal for a woman as it had for a man. While a man in power could use his influence to have sex with anyone he wanted, a woman in command was expected to keep more monogamous. But Hilda did not want to be monogamous or in a relationship. She wanted to be independent and to follow her desires, including the sexual ones. She promised herself that once she seized control, she would do what she wanted regardless of what her male peers thought about it. 
The leadership for the other factions entered the boardroom, as did Hilda's second in charge of House Muller, Hilda's cousin, Michael Muller. Hilda studied Michael. The rest of House Muller had been shocked when he chose to step down to Hilda without a fight, but she had anticipated it. Michael was a man who enjoyed wealth and relaxed life with his family, but hated power. And the responsibilities that lay therein. Michael did not want to be on the board at all, but Hilda had convinced, or perhaps threatened him, to stay on the board and follow her lead. Old Michael was perfect where he was, giving her credibility to her claim for power while not intervening nor arguing with her. The other factions represented were House White, House Cheng, House Bolivar, and House Goldstein. The latter being among the five of the most powerful factions. Again, due to the almost complete destruction of House Rashid, watching the group of foreign dignitaries, Hilda took a deep breath and prepared to speak. One point nine. Hilda Muller becomes the leader for the Terran Council. Hilda Muller was looking at the gathered dignitaries in the top floor meeting room of European Tower. As always, the peak level meeting had two representatives from each faction, but Hilda could not recognize many of them, as they were all new due to massacre at the Presidium Summit caused by the Xenu invasion. In a way that suited her well, as it would be difficult for her to claim power if all the old faction leaders were still around. Now, on the other hand, she was the one with the best claim to authority, with proven success in repelling the Xenu invasion. Hilda Muller began to talk. She said, "Dear delegates, welcome to the Terran Council meeting for March two thousand eight hundred and seventy-five." We have many things to discuss, but we start off with a formality. You are to verify my position as chairwoman for the Terran Council, as well as supreme commander for Terran Council security forces. The delegates sat dumbfounded and didn't know how to react. They had all anticipated a lot more pleasantries and formalities before taking up this sensitive topic. Eventually, Ping Chen spoke up. Miss Muller, my apologies, but I think you have misunderstood how the council works. The council strives to mediate and come up with compromises between the leading factions to maximize profits. You haven't made a case for your claim yet. Hilda smirked sarcastically towards. Ping Chen. Before she replied, she said, "I don't think you know who I really am. I was at Rashidium when the Zenus first struck. I was one of the few survivors, and do you know why? Because I struck back. I killed several of those beasts on my own before I could be evacuated." I have saved us by repelling the Zenus and securing the perimeters to the portals. That is worth more than whatever financial achievements the rest of you claim to have. James Goldstein joined the conversation. He said, "While the situation is dire, it's good to have my faction back on the council." I recommend that we do not choose another House Muller candidate, as Joachim Muller's chairmanship led to a disastrous result: the loss against the Martians and the utter unpreparedness for the alien invasion. No, no, Hilda said. Silence, you fool! 
You Goldsteins have been infighting for decades, and under your leadership, we would have fallen to the Sinu invaders. The people need and want a strong leader, and that can keep them safe. I am that leader. The last thing they need is another avarious money counter. James said, "Since when do you dictate what the people need?" Hilda said, "I don't, but you must know what is going on with the common man. Who do they turn to? It is not the Bents." I would easily win if it were the popular vote," Ping Chan said. "That might be, Hilda, but the popular vote means little, as this is not a democracy," Hilda said. Six months after the defeat on Mars, and you still discount the popular will? Where would you run if these people turn against you? Enrique Bolivar had heard enough of the quarrel. His territories had been severely affected by the Zenu invasions from the Central American portal, and he knew why his people were still around. And it wasn't the size of his vault that had saved him. Enrique Bolivar said, "Dear delegates, I have heard enough." I lost my father Santiago in Rashidium, and most of us lost loved ones in that attack. What we need right now is security. We cannot achieve that through a single-minded focus. That is why I cast the votes of House Bolivar on the one who saved us, Hilda Muller. Jordan White joined in. He said. I also cast my votes on Hilda. My cousin Marcus told me about her incredible feats of bravery when she single-handedly saved him from the savage alien attack. That is just what we need in these difficult times. James Goldstein said, "From what I have heard, saving him was not the only thing she did." Hilda said. Whatever you are implying is irrelevant. I got the majority vote," James Goldstein said. "So it would seem. Such a sad state the council is in when a promiscuous woman becomes the leader," Hilda said. "Oh, it's not the Bronze Age any more. Let your buddy Abraham know that if you see him. Anyways." Thank you, Enrique and Jordan, for voting for me. Now let me tell you how I plan to take the fight to our enemies. After this, Hilda gave a detailed account for how she planned to fight the Xenos and what contributions she required for this coming war. One point ten. Sabina is born. Some months later, in July two thousand eight hundred and seventy-five, Melissa gave birth to Sabina, Metatron's and Kayla's only daughter. She was a healthy child despite her embryo being cryogenically frozen for over a year before she was reinserted into Melissa, her surrogate mother. When Metatron studied the lively gaze in her light green eyes, he could feel her soul, and he was happy that he had opted to have her born by a surrogate mother, instead of having her born from a synthetic womb. Metatron visited Melissa as she was recovering from childbirth. Melissa said, "She is beautiful, isn't she?" The daughter of yours and Kayla's, Sabina," Mister Turn said. "She is our daughter, Melissa. I want her to feel that way when she is growing up," Melissa said. "But she can't be. We haven't even had intercourse," Mister Turn said. 
That's true, but I don't want her to find out the truth, that her mother is dead. But before she died, she released man-eating monsters devastating Earth. And also because of Kayla, that the megalomaniac villain, Melchior Durovich, is now terrorizing Mars with his army of mind-controlled soldiers. Melissa said, so what do you want us to do? To pretend to Sabina that we are husbands and wives and that she is our daughter? Metatron said, no, I want us to get married, so we really are husband and wife. For all the essential reasons, you and I are her parents. That is if you would like to marry me. Melissa said, I would love to marry you, Grandmaster Metatron. Metatron said, I'm happy to hear that, Melissa. I will make an announcement to make it official, and then we will invite all of Eden to the ceremony and the party. I got to go back to work now. I'll come by a bit later. After having left the room, Metatron retreated to his private bedroom, locked the doors, and cried. He had decided that there and then to finally give up on Kayla and move on with his life. He had to move on. He had a child to look after now, and he could not raise a child, obsessing over that child's dead biological mother. A lie and a new beginning, that was the best solution for everyone. And in time, Metatron was confident that he and Melissa could form a happy family. Melissa was, after all, a perfect woman, Loyal, obedient, loving, and hard-working. But compared to Kayla, she just lacked the beauty, the fire, and the drive that made Kayla extraordinary. Metatron decided that he would not tell Sabina the truth about her mother. It was better for everyone involved if Sabina grew up to be a good Edenite woman. In this way, Metatron was old-fashioned. While he had not approved of Abraham's tyrannical ways, he had agreed to the basic premise that the people needed to be part of a society with well-defined roles and rules, where everyone was carrying out their allocated lot in life to improve society. One point eleven: The marriage of Metatron and Melissa and the baptism of Sabina. A few weeks later, it was time for the wedding of Metatron and Melissa and the baptism of Sabina. The preparations for the ceremonies had gone in record pace, and it was imperative for Metatron to get these events organized so that he could clear his mind and look forward. The ceremony took place on Mount Sinai, the holy mountain for the Edenites in the center of Eden. Metatron's former rival, the angel Samuel, was leading both the marriage ceremony and the baptism that took place sequentially. Samuel said, Metatron, swearing on your honor as a servant of the great Yahweh, do you promise to take Melissa as your wife and be fruitful and multiply? Metatron paused. He had hoped that Samuel would not have mentioned Yahweh during the wedding. Both Metatron and Samuel knew that Yahweh had been dead for millennia and it didn't feel right for Metatron to proclaim himself the servant of Yahweh. Then again, Metatron was a supporter of most of the things that Yahweh stood for. So in that sense, Samuel honored him with his words. Eventually, Metatron found an answer that suited him better. Metatron said, As a great supporter and servant of Yahweh's values, I promise to honor my marriage commitment to Melissa. I promise to love Melissa, and if it's my destiny to be fruitful with her, I do. Samuel gave Metatron a skeptical look. 
Theoretically, Metatrone had already been fruitful with Melissa, so why did he say those last words? Samuel decided to go on as if nothing had happened. Uh, yes, you have already been fruitful with the blessed Melissa. And we pray that Yahweh will give you more blessings to come. Melissa, do you promise to honor and obey Metatron until the benevolent Yahweh ends your days? Melissa said, I do. Samuel said, Good. Then I proclaim you husband and wife. After that, Samuel took out the two beautiful rings with expensive gemstones and put them on Metatron's and Melissa's fingers. The people below them were cheering loudly, and after a while, Samuel lifted his hand, instructing them to stop. He then commenced his speech. But today is a blessed day for two reasons, as we also welcome a new member to our Edenite family. I present to you Sabina, a daughter of Metatron and Melissa, blessed by the great Yahweh himself. May this holy water protect you and forever keep you safe. After saying this, there was another loud round of cheering, and after that, celebrations would begin. One point twelve. Hilda Muller interrogates a Zeno prisoner. Hilda Muller and Marcus White were back in the ruins of Rashidium, observing the bluish light of the interdimensional portal over the gilded Cheops pyramid. Returning to Rashidium was terrifying. What had once been the seat of House Rashid and one of the glowing jewel cities of the Terran Council was now a destroyed wasteland, and the smell of death and decay still lay thick over the city. Hilda walked along the abandoned streets of Rashidium when she suddenly was overwhelmed by a foul stench and could hear a faint growl. She turned to her bodyguard, Captain Emma Schindler, and spoke. You said that the city is secured, so why can I smell the stench of the Xenus and hear that faint growl from the building over there? Emma Schindler said, I am terribly sorry, Mistress Hilda. I will lead you back to safety at once. Hilda Muller said, No need, Captain Schindler. I might be the chairwoman of House Muller, but unlike my predecessors, I'm not an armchair general. I want to investigate this town myself. Emma said, but that's incredibly dangerous. Your life is too important to be put at risk. Hilda said, don't worry about me. The Muller troops that fought and died here to save humanity did not back down. And... Neither shall I. I shouldn't allow myself cowardice just because I'm a high-ranking official. Marcus White stared at Hilda in disbelief and spoke. Hilda, come on, don't be stupid. You're not just a high-ranking official. You are the leader of the Terran Council, the single most powerful woman on the planet. Just let your soldiers do their jobs. Hilda shrugged it off. She was a soldier at heart, and besides, she had managed to single-handedly kill several of these beasts when Rashidium was overrun six months earlier. Besides, if they found one Xeno warrior injured and incapacitated, that would prove to be an excellent opportunity to study and communicate with those beasts. Hilda said, Marcus, you stay here with a few guards. Emma and the rest of you soldiers come with me. I want to personally interrogate the wounded Sino warrior. Soldiers, arm your shields and plasma swords. We are entering that building. Cautiously, they entered the building until they reached the source of the stench and sound.
on the third level bathroom where a severely injured senior was lying in a pool of his own blood, missing both legs and arms. But it had been weeks since the last battle, so how could the beast still be alive with the injuries it had sustained? Hilda decided that she had to find a way to communicate with the incapacitated Xeno warrior before it perished. Hilda spoke to the Xeno, she said. Who are you? Why do you come to Earth and fight us? What do you want? The Xeno warrior said, Jiarzramramun, Graal Robot Renda, Ramandrantis Gudu Gudu Gandin. The nation. After saying this, the Xena warrior started drooling and shaking uncontrollably. Emma Schindler raised her plasma sword to try and kill the beast, but Hilda told her off. What are you doing, Emma? she said. This is our first chance to communicate with our enemy and learn about them. You wouldn't waste that opportunity, would you? Emma said. There is nothing to learn about these ugly beasts. They are bloodthirsty, mindless monsters, and we already found a way to repel them. Lasers, orbital bombardments, and landmines. Hilda Muller said, Lucky that I arrived here today, seeing that all my military staff are as small-minded as you are. These beasts understood what I said, or at least it realized that I was communicating to it. And it tried to respond. We have quantum computers capable of decrypting any code. Deciphering the Xenu language should be a piece of cake. Emma said, You are right, Chairwoman Muller. I will connect us to the quantum computer at once. A few minutes later, the quantum computer had analyzed the Xenu language and not only deciphered what the Xenu warrior had said, but also created a likely vocabulary for the entire Xenu language. Hilda Muller uploaded the Xenu vocabulary to the universal translator chip in her brain and started speaking to the Xenu in the Xenu language. So, Ramun the Xenu warrior. You can stop following Randa now because she is nowhere to be seen. Instead, speak to me, Hilda Muller of Earth, and tell me what you know and what you want. Ramun was baffled from hearing a human speak her own language, but eventually she replied, How can you speak my language, human? What kind of sorcery is this? Hilda said, It is not sorcery, it is technology. Travelling through dimensional portals, you should be aware of advanced technology. Ramun said, We, Sinus, don't use technology. We rely on sorcery and the great powers that our god queen Rangda grants us. Hilda said, Oh, you are technologically advanced, all right. We scavenged your fallen brethren of the technology that you were using. Groundbreaking stuff. Unfortunately for you, once we realized how your technology worked, we found a way to counter it. Something you never seem to comprehend. Ramun said, Yes, I heard from my brethren that we have had problems with the guile and smarts of you humans before. Back when you were fighting for the Zetans against us Xenus in the multi-millennial interstellar war. Hilda Muller said, What are you talking about? There is no mention of a multi-millennial interstellar war in human history. Ramon said, You humans... Followed the vile Zetans like they were your gods, refusing the one true god, Rangda, in her holy quest to free the galaxy of Zetans' falsehood and deceit. Check your religious scriptures and you'll find plenty of references to the war, or as you see it, the heavenly fight between good and evil. Hilda said, interesting, but not very relevant. 
Tell me about your god queen, Rengda. Who is she and how do I kill her? The moon said, You already know who she is. You saw her during our first attack when we extracted our prisoner, Kayla. You fought me back then. You fought me valiantly and that's why I'm talking to you. Hilda said, That rings a bell, although I haven't seen enough of you to recognize individual Venus. Did I do this to you? Ramon said, Yes, and now you must finish the job. Kill me and eat me as is our custom. Hilda said, Sure, if you tell me how you survive for six months in this wounded physical state. Ramon said, I crawled and wriggled using my torso to get here. We Xenus are very resilient and recover from almost any wound. We can't, however, regrow dismembered limbs. Hilda Muller said, But that's six months ago. How can you still be alive if I dismembered you back then? Ramon said, Our home planet Sinora is incredibly harsh, and only the fiercest beast can survive there. Besides, six months, as you call it, is only two days on our home planet. Hilda said, That's enough for now. You are my prisoner and will be fed and continuously interrogated. Ramon said, But you promised to kill me if I spoke. Hilda said, I will kill you, but not now. That's not how humans treat valuable prisoners. And that is why we are going to come after your Queen Ragnar for what she did to us. Ramon growled and roared, but it mattered little. Hilda had her prisoner, and she wouldn't let a promise she made towards a murderous beast stop this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get a better understanding of humanity's new enemy, Ragnar.